Hey everyone, welcome to Garden Fork Radio. This is your host, Eric. I'm here with my friend, Eric, E-R-I-K, who I call West Coast Eric, from Root Simple. Welcome, sir. Hey, hello, East Coast Eric. So we're a couple thousand miles away, but we're kind of uh, twin brothers of different mothers. And we were going to mainly talk about a friend of yours who started the Institute of Domestic Technology, but you I always like how you have taught classes and during this this crazy time where we have to stay inside um, this seems more relevant than ever and you just wrote a blog post about your friend who passed away and posthumously this book was published um, called The New Homemade Kitchen about doing stuff in your own house so I thought we could talk about it for a little bit you have a friend Joseph Schuldiner Diner Diner Schuldiner. Schuldiner, yeah. who had started something called the Institute of Domestic Technology. You guys taught these cool classes, and then posthum- posthumously, a book is published about that called The New Homemade Kitchen, 250 Recipes and Ideas for Reinventing the Art of Preserving, Canning, Fermenting, Dehydrating, and more. So um, I thought that kind of be like a starting point for stuff we usually talk about. How, yeah, so, yeah, go ahead. How did you get involved with that? Well, I was just remembering this story. It's a pretty funny story. So uh, I had a friend of mine who had a, a cabin in a very remote part of the Tehachapi Mountains up above, you know, Southern California here. And um, we went on a trip there because a neighbor of his in this part of the Tehachapis had a bunch of medlar trees. Now, do you know what a medlar tree is? No. Yeah, no one does, right? It's a it's a medieval kind of era tree that um, is still grown primarily in Iran now, but um, it's a relative of the apple tree. And um, when uh, you let the fruit kind of blet, I love that word, which is sort of like I don't know, it's not exactly rot, but it softens on the tree. And this thing makes a fruit that is like, um, tastes like applesauce, actually. It's really amazing. More people should grow it. In fact, people actually where you live, where it's cold, can grow it. Oh, neat. Anyways, so we were there to harvest the medlars because this friend of mine was going to sell them at the Santa Monica Farmer's Market for like this incredible amount of money. They're very like precious things. So (laughs) we were up to do the medlar harvest, which turned into a party. And that's where I met Joseph, who then later went on to uh, found, as you said, the Institute of Domestic Technology, uh, which was this like very cool cooking class thing that um, basically these classes, it was like an all day class. And it was all the stuff that, as I said in the blog post, are kind of things that you wouldn't ever think of doing from scratch, but once you learn to do them, then you'll just keep doing them, right? As in stuff that you and I are interested in, like canning and cheese making and drying things and making cocktails from scratch and all that kind of stuff, and bread making. So he had me teach the bread classes there. So we would typically like teach a bread class and then there'd be a jam class and then a cheese class and a lunch and then at the end of it, everyone would have bread, cheese, and jam. Nice. And a really cool idea. Actually, mustard making was another one that was very popular, and coffee roasting. And we did them in um, interesting buildings in L.A. Uh, one of them was the Zane Gray estate. Zane Gray was a famous Western writer, so the classes were in the, his house. And the other was at a, a Greystone Mansion in Beverly Hills, which is this amazing historic building that normally you don't get to go into. But if you took the class, you could go in. Huh. And the classes were done in the servants' kitchen. Um, so it was an amazing, um, amazing idea. A lot of work, too. We, we'd haul all this equipment in and for all the students and uh it was it was a great experience joseph was a lot of fun to work with very creative very gifted designer too so he'd always have these really beautiful handouts for the classes so it was it was a lot of fun and we'd always have an after party as teachers too where we'd sit around and um have a glass of wine and talk about the classes and about uh, making food from scratch 
and he's to me he's an example of the power of what one person can do because I mean no one gave him a grant to do that no one no company hired him to start this he just said I'm gonna do this thing and he found some like-minded people and he just made it happen and I I love to celebrate that kind of thing because I don't know if really Garden Fork compares or if Root Simple compares, but I just one day, st I've always wanted to share cool stuff, and then one day I just started to make videos. And it just snowballed. And with Root Simple, I mean, how did Root Simple start? Root Simple started as a whim one afternoon when I was like, how can I put together all these like disparate ideas into one thing? Yes. And it just started as a blog. and. That was that. I mean, how did Garden Fork start? The same kind of way, because I just was like, like this morning. Like this morning, I just glued a bunch of PVC pipe together in the basement for plumbing, and I'm like, how can I make this interesting? You know, and but yeah, it's kind of like you, me, and and Joseph come from that DIY like zine culture kind of era. You know, we're all kind of the same age, roughly. If Joseph was a few years older, but. Um, definitely that DIY ethos. Oh, anyways, I'm sorry, Eric, I interrupted you. No, it's fine. That's the, that's the beauty of the podcast. <laughs> so, yeah. But he, so the thing that I find daunting about the in-person classes is the, um, the logistics of it. You know, you have to haul, like you said, you had to haul that gear to a place, to a meeting place and that, and um, that's the part where I start to short circuit because I always think of having some in-person event. Well, you can't really do it right now, but um, but he he followed through it and persevered. And then did he start writing the book and then pass away or, or some friends put it together after the fact? Or Yeah, this is actually his second book. His first book is called Pure Vegan, uh, oh. and it's, it's really good, actually. Uh, it's a vegan cookbook written by someone. Joseph was not really, he was sort of vegetarian, although if there was bacon around, he would grab something. It was kind of <laughs> like that, you know, flexitarian, really. Uh, but the Pure Vegan's a really good book, actually. There's a lot of um, recipes in there that you could serve to people who aren't vegan, and they wouldn't even know that it came from a vegan cookbook. So it's, it's, all, and it's also really beautifully designed, too, and photographed that, that, you know, that he did all the work for that, too. A lot of work. So yeah, this is his second book that he was working on when he uh, passed away. Yeah, we have um, some friends that are vegan, and when I have them over, I don't even tell the other people, "Oh, well, the vegans are coming." You know, I just make vegan food, and I don't even make a, I don't make any noise about it. I just say, "Here's what we're having," you know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, I here. actually, I there's a um, there is a YouTube channel called the Lucky Peach. These two are the Irish twins who run an organic grocery store. They have this enormous energy, and they're vegan, and they've inspired me to – they got me to cook curry, actually. I call it white guy curry. It was pretty simple. <laughs> but um, there will be a video coming out soon about that. But, um, again, an example of two guys who had a, a dream and made it happen. But let's get back to the, the book and your friend. So what – as far as the classes, the, there were like three classes over the span of a day then? kind of three or four i'm trying to remember i think it would be like four and a break for lunch is kind of the way it would it would run um and it was kind of like a party too because uh some of the people helping who host who lived at the zangre estate uh Stephen and gloria uh they kind of ran it like a party huh? so um it was it was a lot of fun to teach and, it, and the, i think the students had a really good time too because, you know, you got cooking class, but also there was, you know, lunch and a chance to hang out. And, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And Joseph was really good um, at uh, developing the classes. So, like, the one thing I learned is, like, always teach things in order uh, that you do them. So, you know, try to keep it uh, clear. Always have a handout. We always had a handout. And then after the class, we would all sit down and like do some constructive criticism to figure out, okay, this worked, this didn't work, let's change this next time. Uh, because you know, a cooking class is a lot can a lot can go wrong. And um, if you have like 15, 20 people with different levels of ability, then it can get it can get challenging. So it was um, we really I think we really did a good job developing those classes, and Joseph did a really good job. Um, 
in, in terms of leadership, in terms of um, making sure those classes were well organized and uh, things worked. Because as you know, like sometimes the jam doesn't set, right? So right. <laughs> we had to figure out things like that and uh, you know make, make sure that things worked, troubleshoot stuff. My challenge has always been um, finding, you know, when I've gone to classes like that, is there's always some student that wants all their questions answered and they're constantly interrupting and it's, it's, yes. and they, I don't know if they want to be the center of attention or, or they just have this mm -hmm. incredible need to share. And I just sit there and I start to steam. I'm like, I'm like, could you just stop talking? Could we just, could you just learn right now? You know? Yeah, no, that was, that's a lesson when you're teaching, you sometimes have the know-it-all, right? I think is what you're talking about. Yeah. And you really do, you have to say, yeah, you know what, let's hold this until afterwards or you can speak to me afterwards, but we need to keep going. And so you have to, you have to keep control of the room and that's, and that's out of um, consideration to the other students as the teacher, you yeah. have to, you have to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen it where the teacher doesn't do that. And then you're like, and then it, um, anyway, but yeah, that's a good thing. I'll, I'll remember that the next, I don't know. It'd be, I always think about teaching classes, but then I, I don't know what I would teach because everything I do, you can find in a free video, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I, I'm sure people would love to take a class from you. You should do it. I'll have to think about that after the after the craziness is over. So. Yeah. All right. So you um, mentioned in your blog post about roasting your own coffee with a popcorn popper. Mm -hmm. Yes, the whirly pop. Which is which the... is this old yeah. school roundy go round which i've seen it in like the the homesteading catalogs yeah it's a popcorn popper with a crank basically yeah that that of all the because as a as a student at the institute um i i got to take other classes and there were some coffee roasting classes taught by a few people actually different different folks over the over the years and that was probably the most useful thing that I got out of the Institute. And it's funny when this pandemic hit, suddenly people are roasting coffee again, because it's actually, it's another one of these like pandemic friendly activities because green coffee can sit around for a very long time in buckets or whatever, and you just roast it when you need it. And um, roasting coffee in the whirly pop is fairly simple i mean once or one or two times to, to kind of take get the hang of it which is more or less like how much heat you need to apply to to the, the coffee but once you get the hang of that it's pretty easy and um i order my coffee through um sweet maria's in oakland and they have amazing uh coffee from single source places that uh, you know essentially it cost me about $10 a pound for the equivalent of $20 a pound, very, very fancy coffee. Oh, wow. And I actually just, I order the, they have like a random variety pack they will send you of just coffees from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's always a surprise when they come. And the, um, the biodiversity in coffee will really surprise people if you do that because some beans are tiny, some are large, they're processed in different ways in different parts of the world, uh, and they taste totally different. Um, and the thing, I like a really light roast because with a light roast, you get more of the flavor of the coffee. Mm -hmm. You also get more of the caffeine. And uh, roasting your own, you get to control that. And uh, like the coffee that I roasted um, a few days ago is just downright weird. Um, in a good way, um, lots of different flavors that you wouldn't expect in coffee, and it really comes through when you roast it yourself. Um, and it's just a, it's a, it's a really one of the useful kind of like homestead type activities that really is like handy right now. I have to say, um, the downside it's a little smoky in the kitchen. Yep. So. People with an outdoor kitchen have a little bit of an advantage here. Um, I'm considering getting an electric roaster, um, but guess what? They're all sold out right now. Yeah. <laughs> because everyone's roasting coffee. 
Uh, that would allow me to roast outdoors because I don't have like an outdoor kitchen. So, um, but it's not, I mean, Kelly complains a little bit about the smoke, but she does like the coffee. So there's that. Uh, I, I opened the, the windows and it's, it's still a bit smoky, but uh, I think it's worth it for the coffee. But yeah, I'm, I'm definitely thinking of another roasting technique. There's many different roasting techniques. And actually that I, I don't have any relationship with Sweet Maria's, but if you go to their website, they have tons of videos about different ways to roast coffee. I mean, you can just roast it in a, a cast iron skillet too, and which is the way it's done in, in Ethiopia. If you've been to an Ethiopian restaurant, sometimes they'll do that for you. They have a little coffee roasting kind of ceremony thing oh, wow. and they'll roast in a pan and um, it's, it's, it works. So, you know, don't let, uh, don't let the tool get in the way of the activity. There's different ways to do it. You could also um, throw a box fan in your window, get the smoke out. Yeah, that's true. What I but have done, I'm lazy. sorry. Um, I'm lazy. Also, Go if, if you want to take it outside, I got a, um, um, a, an induction cooktop that mm. draw. I mean, it only draws a couple watts. It's in, and, and it has the cool surface. It's not like that electric coil little portable cooktop. And I, like when I want to cook fish or steak, um, I just step outside and I plug it into the outdoor outlet. And maybe you could um, do that. I mean, there's like 65 bucks on um, Amazon. I'll, really? I'll link to one I have. Yeah. This is why I talk to you. Because that, you know, I'm uh, maybe induction cooktops are in short supply right now. but <laughs> Probably. But that's a great idea. Yeah, it works. And it's really quite, it's amazing how fine-tuned you can fine-tune the the heat on one of these little cooktops and maybe even find one in a yard sale. Who knows? But that was just my thought there. But so and it's small too, right? It's like a, like a hot plate. Yeah, it's like a, it's outside. like a oversized hot plate and it, it, hmm. huh, it has some electronics in it. And, um, I ruined mine cause I was trying to melt beeswax in it and I got beeswax all over the <laughs> cooktop, God. but it still works. So Will it work with the whirly pop though? It, it doesn't have, you have to have certain types of metal, right? Isn't well, it that... can't be aluminum. It can't, um, or stainless. I don't think it can be. I could be wrong about that. Can't be one of those things. Yeah, I always forget. Anyways, I have to look it up. Cast iron works. I know that. Cast iron works. Okay. Yeah. And then there was also. Did you teach the mustard class, or you took the mustard class? No. Um, the mustard class uh, was really, really uh, another one that it's one of those ones that I should be doing, but don't, which is just stupid. It was taught by a, a great guy named Zach Nagan, who um, he's, a, he's actually it was a waiter for a long time. Now he owns a wine bar. I need to check in with him because I hope he's doing OK, because I imagine that business is um, difficult right now for him. But he taught the. Um, he taught the mustard class, and all you do is combine mustard seeds and vinegar and whatever else you want to put in there, beer or whatever, and throw it in a blender, and that's kind of, that's it. So it's like, why buy mustard, which is kind of expensive. So yeah, I've been, yeah, that's one of the ones on the I need to do this list. I really like mustard, too. So uh Joseph had a little jokey thing he called the flavor bar, which we would set up. So there were different spices so you could, you know, tweak things in, in many of the classes, actually. And one of the classes we had that for was the mustard class. Uh, yeah, that's a that's an easy entry level thing. The book actually has a whole chapter on um, mustard and salad dressing and ketchup and harissa and sriracha and mayonnaise and all, all the kind of like... Um, pantry items you can make for yourself nut butter vanilla extract that's another one on my to-do list out of oh, this yeah. book i don't know why i buy vanilla extract because all it is is vanilla beans and alcohol which yep. you can do yourself and save a lot of money you know so yeah also you can um with the pandemic going on you know bookstores or your local bookstores closed but i have found that you can just go to your local bookstore's website and you can order books and depending on the bookstore, it'll either be, they'll drop ship it from their distributor to you, or you can um, oblong books in Millerton, New York, which is um, near where our little weekend place is. They will um, tell you 
people that you can call and they will leave your books in a little bag outside the door and it being up in the country no one's going to steal your books you know so uh, it's instead of ordering the books from one of the evil empires you could still order this book from your local bookstore even though they are closed so yeah curbside pickup yeah definitely um another thing i've been doing during this pandemic is actually uh ordering ebooks directly from publishers which you can do too as pdfs yes. so i've been doing that and um i don't know about this particular book but um but yeah that's another thing and of course the library too our library has a service called Libby, which is an app, mm -hmm. and um, they have like a lot of ebooks there that you can download and uh, audiobooks too. What am I'm using? I'm using a app from the library called Flipster, which allows you to read magazines online. Yes, they have. Uh, yeah, they have that too, and they have Canopy, which is their um, library equivalent of Netflix. It tends to be like independent movies and things like that. Oh yes, those serious films. There's there's serious there's some non serious films in there too, I think. It tends to be more of the serious stuff, yeah. There's no Will Ferrell movies in there. So there's no Will Ferrell movies in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Well I'll link to this all everything we talked about here, I'll link to it in the show notes here. But um I just thought you guys would be interested in the idea of doing some more hands-on stuff while we're we're having to stay at home or shelter or whatever we want to call it it's just and i think this can carry over um i've always wanted to make cheese and for some reason i have this mental block about making it so here we go huh. yeah yeah I'm not, cheese making if you have a dairy source that's that's a good one if not i, I don't know i'm not huge we've we've done it but um and it's you know you can make very simple cheeses it's a fun thing to do so uh, it's not something we've really explored in depth all right cool well usually at this point in the show i read itunes reviews and we don't have any new itunes reviews so i don't know i'm a little crushed there i need to write one for you <laughs> All right, you can find Eric at Root Simple, and he also has the Root Simple podcast. And I'm pretty sure if you go find the Root Simple podcast within the week, um, you're going to hear me. Yes. Because uh, we're going to record that right now. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Excellent. Garden Fork Radio's executive producer is Jimmy Goots. You can find more information about Jimmy and the custom hollow books he makes at hollowbooks.com. Our theme music is used under license from uniquetracks.com. Other music used in the show is used under license from audioblocks.com. Mm -hmm.